Thank you so much for joining us for tonight's talk um, titled Arizona, where water is king and the shadow is queen. Um, we are so happy to have you all here and we are really looking forward to this presentation. Um, as we go along with this uh, program tonight, we're asking that everybody uh, leaves their microphones on mute and cameras um, off as we can get the best recording. If you have any questions throughout the presentation, there will be time for question and answer at the end of the presentation. We're asking that you just use the chat feature at the bottom of your uh, Zoom screen and just drop your question in there and we'll make sure to address it at the end after the presentation is over. So, um, so just a quick introduction. Um, my face, uh, my name is Shannon Fleischman and I am the curator at the Arizona Historical Society at the um, Arizona Heritage Center in Tempe. And you also see uh, Dr. James Burns, who is the executive director at the Arizona Historical Society. And next we'll introduce our fabulous presenters. James, you're on mute. You know, you would think, given that I teach every week, and I have to say that to my students, that I would know that. I'm sorry about that. James Burns, welcome to tonight's program. It's my pleasure to introduce our speakers for the evening. Eileen Snotty, who has worked for the Salt River Project since the mid-1980s in a variety of capacities, most recently for the past two decades in the Research, Archives, and Heritage Department, where she's a senior representative managing educational programming and exhibition development. Eileen holds a bachelor's degree in history from ASU and is a passionate advocate for National History Day Arizona, which is run by the Arizona Historical Society. She works with nonprofit institutions throughout Arizona, making connections with the community to SRP's past, present, and future. And our other co-presenter this evening, Dr. Doug Kupel, who worked for the City of Phoenix City Attorney's Office and later in the City Manager's Office for three decades as an environmental historian conducting water uh, uh, research for water rights litigation. After retiring from Phoenix, he worked for the city of Glendale, Arizona, as the deputy director of the Water Services Department. Doug is still active in the environmental consulting field now for the private sector. He's conducted extensive research in the area of water history, specializing in Native American water rights and municipal use. Doug has authored several articles for the Arizona Historical Society's Journal of Arizona History. He holds an MA in history from the University of Arizona and a master's in educational leadership from NAU and a PhD in history from ASU. Doug has served as an adjunct faculty member at ASU, Phoenix College and Gateway Community College. He is the author of Fuel for Growth, Water and Arizona's Urban Environment. And he now teaches in the Global Security Program at Embry-Riddle University in Prescott. And it's also my pleasure this evening to um, announce and to thank our co-sponsor and partner for tonight's program and a program that we have coming up on March 3rd that you'll hear a little bit more about from Shannon. And that is the Phoenix Mural Festival. And on the right side of your screen there, you can see uh, the list of events that are e occurring as part of this year's festival. So we're doing this program about the history of water in Arizona to kick off the beginning of the festival. And then we'll have a bookend program at the end of the festival in early March, which will feature some of the mural artists. Turning it back over to you, Shannon. Okay, so just a little bit about the Arizona Historical Society uh, for those of you who are first time joiners for us. Um, we are the um, oldest Arizona Historical Society in the state and we have four locations, one in Yuma, one in Flagstaff, one in Tempe and one in Tucson. And um, our mission that we strive to do is to, co to connect people through the power of Arizona history. And you can see the kind of diverse programming that we're attempting to connect multiple groups of people in our upcoming slide about upcoming programming. One thing that we want to shout out, though, is we have worked very hard on creating this super cool license plate that features a monsoon 
um, scene. And unfortunately in 2020, we didn't get that much of monsoon. So maybe we're, we're putting it out there that we can get some more rain, especially with this water rights uh, conversation that we have going tonight. So one way that you can sh show your support and show your Arizona history pride is looking to get an Arizona historical license plate and you can get those through any of the Arizona DMV services. And uh, just a heads up, we do have two of our locations that are open. They are open Tuesday through Saturday from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. And that is our location in Tucson, which is the Arizona History Museum, and our location in Tempe, the Arizona Heritage Center. And so you can plan your visit and get tickets all at azhs.org. Some of the exhibit highlights, we have an exhibit on Barry Goldwater in our uh, Tucson location. And I cannot stress this enough how cool it is that we have his ham radio desk. It is gigantic. Um, to see some photos of him sitting in front of it, you can't get to scale, but this desk is like the size of my living room. It's so big. So it's one of those things that you have to see in person. I would really encourage you to go check it out. And then our other exhibit in uh, Tempe is called Still Marching from Suffrage to Hashtag Me Too. And it looks at women's movements in the state of Arizona up through the, the push for voting rights all the way through the Hashtag Me Too movement of recent. And then our upcoming programs, we have some really great programs coming up for the rest of this month. Next week on Wednesday, we have Preserving Arizona's COVID-19 Stories. And this is a, um, a partnership with the Arizona State University's Journal of the Plague Year, which has been archiving COVID experiences, not only from around the state, but from around the globe. And so we're gonna be sharing some of those stories with you and teaching you how to preserve your own COVID stories. So that's next Wednesday, February 10th at six. Um, the following week on Thursday, the 18th, we have um, Women Who Brew with Megan Greenwood, who is featured in our Still Marching um, exhibition in Tempe. And she's gonna talk about her um, new brewery that opened in downtown Phoenix called Greenwood Brewing and what it's like to be a woman brewer in Arizona. And finally, we have an Ask the Author series that looks at um, the Cold War in the state of Arizona. And that's on Thursday, um, February 25th, and also at 6 p.m. If you would like to join any of these uh, uh, presentations, you do it the same way you signed up for this one, azhs.org backslash calendar. Come join us. And if you like my voice, you're gonna get to see them on three of or two of these three upcoming programs. And Lastly, we want to we want to encourage you all to become members because these are the kind of stories that we're we're continuing to share, but you also get the best deal. So you get a discount and you get a subscription to the Journal of Arizona History. And the next slide really looks at how amazing our Arizona Journal History is. This is the most recent issue. It's a double issue. It's over 400 pages of scholarship looking at the importance and relevance of Arizona and our diverse state. So I cannot not um, encourage you enough to go and sign up for this because this issue is like an issue for the ages. You're gonna find something for everybody in there. So with that, if you have any other questions, you can always find us at azhs.org for our newest, newest, latest news and events, excuse me. And I'm gonna turn it over to James and our fantastic presenters. Thank you, Shannon. Um, I love it when you uh, cheerlead for AHS because I was not born with a radio or TV voice. Apparently I was born with a professor voice, which is why I get to be the moderator for this evening's program. And I'm um, thrilled to be working with two longtime colleagues. So I'm just gonna get our presentation started here. And uh, the way this is gonna work tonight is it's really gonna be a bit of a back and forth conversation between Doug, Eileen and I, and um, bits of their presentation are all woven together. So uh, hopefully this will all go very smoothly. You should now be seeing the presentation. Where Water is King and the Shadow is Queen, Turkish author and playwright Mehmet Murat Ildan once wrote in the empire of desert, water is the king. 
and Shadow is the Queen. Tonight, you'll hear a story about water in the Sonoran Desert, giving new meaning to the phrase, the desert smells like rain. First, I'll turn it over to Eileen. Well, thank you for having me tonight. I'm very honored to be a part of the program here. I apologize for the camera. It's brand new. I haven't had a chance to um, adjust any of the settings on it. Real quick also, I have six Labrador retrievers. So if you hear barking at any time in the background, we've tried to corral them into the other room so that they don't disturb us tonight. So on behalf of Salt River Project also, I am thrilled to be here. And what I wanted to start off a little bit was we're gonna be kind of going um, small local state, local state kind of back and forth. So I just wanted to give a really brief introduction to the early, early pre-SRP where I have a map, there's a map up right now and it's some of our early canals. But what's important about it is I wanted to show some of the icons down at the bottom that will show a little bit about how the Salt River Valley has grown with Salt River Project, um, Arizona becoming a state, and today. So the little tractor is going to be, of course, our irrigation or our, excuse me, our um, acres that are farmed. The little people icon is going to be Maricopa County population. The wavy lines are water for our water customers. And then, of course, the electric light bulb is going to show our power customers. And these are going to fluctuate through the presentation part that's by SRP. But I wanted to start off with the map. Um, uh, I wanted to start with Salt River Project just didn't come in and start working the water system here in Arizona. There was an early group of indigenous people here before us um, who laid out their canal system from about AD, uh, 1 AD to about 1450 AD. They came into the valley and saw this fertile valley. We can grow things, we can be agriculturalists. So the uh, gray lines, the light gray lines that are in there show um, their early canal system. Um, then they go into disrepair because these indigenous population has moved out of the state. And now 400 years later in the 1880s, we have new settlers that are coming into the valley, Anglo settlers, and they're realizing, hey, this is an arid environment, but we're seeing this early canal system. Maybe we can use this system. Hmm, how can we rework it? So they realized that in order to survive here, we needed water. And so they unearthed these canals from the indigenous population that was here earlier. Um, today, our current system, which is the dark blue lines, is um, Salt River Project's canal system that we maintain and operate. Um, we have boundaries. So we have the Arizona Canal as our most northern boundary, then the Western Canal at, as our southern boundary. And um, we currently now maintain about 1,300 miles of canals and laterals throughout the Phoenix metropolitan area. You can go on. And then our next slide, I'll turn it over to you, Doug. Okay. Um, oh, there we go. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Okay. Well, thanks very much, Eileen. Uh, I appreciate that uh, that start there, and uh, you got us off to a great start. So uh, I'm going to begin by talking about uh, prior appropriation, because uh, that's the basis of water rights in the West. And to put it simply, first in time is first in right. So the first person to put the water to use has the first right to it. And that concept of prior appropriation comes from uh, the mining uh, community. And of course, uh, the West was settled by miners going back to the, the gold rush of uh, 1849. Uh, we'll skip the Spanish and Mexican era for the moment. You know, historians always like to start at the beginning, but uh, if you have a mining claim, you're the first person to claim it, you have the right to the mine. So uh, that was applied to water. The first person to put it to use had the right to it. So uh, that's a prior appropriation. And uh, that's significant uh, in the West. And if you look at that one slide on the uh, right side of your screen there, you'll see uh, a difference around the 100th meridian between the East and the West. 
And in the eastern portion of the country, you have about 20 inches of rainfall a year, which is enough to grow crops. So you don't need to have uh, irrigation. But when you get west of that, the 100th meridian is dry and arid. And so in that area, you do have to apply uh, irrigation water in order to make crops grow. Now, of course, there's uh, some exceptions there in the uh, <clears throat> central portion of California, Willamette Valley of uh, Oregon, those areas. So uh, first in time, first in right allows that irrigation to happen. Now, the other thing that has to happen is uh, settlers have to get out there. And that, that second slide is about uh, railroad land grants, uh, but it also illustrates uh, a couple of other things. And I'm going to talk about the Homestead Act, but the Pacific Railroad Act and the Homestead Act were both in 1862 uh, during the Civil War. And of course, there's a reason for that because all the Southerners had left Congress and so the Northerners were able to pass this legislation. And their goal was to uh, spread free labor uh, in the West as of course opposed to uh, slavery. And uh, much uh, prior to that, actually in uh, 1787 with the, um, there was a, a land ordinance. They established this the township and range system. So they divided up all the area in the country into these uh, six mile square sections, which is a, a township. So, uh, and of course we see that today in Phoenix. If you go down Baseline Road, you're uh, driving on a township. Seventh Avenue is a township line. Uh, the 7th Street, all those big roads are on one mile a section. So uh, they were granted, uh, homesteaders were 160 acres uh, if they lived on it for five years. And that's how they transferred uh, hundreds of acres of land. And uh, the other part is the uh, Desert Land Act of 1877. And in the West, since they didn't have uh, as much water, they allowed people to use irrigation, if they could spread irrigation water over the land, they could make a claim for it. I'm gonna stop there because I have a feeling I'm going over a little time. So I'm going to uh, uh, stop with that. We're gonna turn it back over to Eileen a little bit, who's gonna talk about uh, the Salt River Project's watershed, which is vast. Well, what is so neat about our watershed is that um, the early, early settlers coming into Arizona really were, had a foresight about them. They, they saw the need for water, which of course is considered liquid gold here. Water, liquid gold, what more can you call it but that? But what they saw is that they saw the connection um, between snow on our watershed and water in the valley. So what they did was they thought, hmm, it consists of the, you know, all these snowpack is coming in and we need to be sure that it is set aside and it is safe because that's where our water is gonna come to the valley. So what they did was they asked the federal government to protect these areas from timbering, grazing, and by making these a forest reserve. So today they're national forests here. And it's a 13,000 mile, 13,000 square miles of land. And it provides water to approximately 550 square miles of land in the Salt River Valley. So on the map that was um, before Doug's that I showed you of our um, canal system, that's the watershed that's providing water for the Salt River Valley here. So it goes to show you again, water, liquid gold, it's just not gonna happen on its own. We have to find some way to control it and ensure in this dry desert climate of the Salt River Valley that it can provide water for us and we need to take care of it so that we always have a steady supply or a steady source of water coming down to the valley. And then I'll turn it, I think, next over to Doug 
Well, to Doug or to Eileen, my, my question is, there's, there's something that I've heard about called the Kibbe decision, or sometimes uh, known as Wormser versus Salt River Valley. Would one of you like to tell us a little bit about that before we go on and talk about the Reclamation Act? Do you want to talk about it, Doug? Or? Yeah, I'll go ahead and take a stab at that one. Um... And you can uh, you can back clean up and uh, yeah. fix it if I didn't get everything quite right. Yeah. That's a 1892 decision, I, I believe, and the significance of that is it establishes the principle that water uh, belongs to the land. Mm -hmm. And uh, prior to SRP, there were some independent, uh, privately owned uh, canal companies. And uh, those uh, folks were really in the water sales business and they had the idea uh, they could uh, move that water around and sell it to anybody, the highest bidder. But in that uh, Kibbe decree, uh, Judge uh, Kibbe states, well, no, uh, that water belongs to the land under that theory of prior appropriation. So the first people that put it to use on that land, uh, the water stays with that land. So that was a very significant uh, decision. And if you look at that map, you see how large the watershed and how small the uh, SRP lands are. Mm -hmm. And it's that way because of prior appropriation and uh, that way that water cannot be uh, severed from the land. And that's a very significant and important decision for us. And the Kibbe decree decision kind of set the stage for Salt River Project being able to manage the water because you couldn't have um, canal companies claiming that the water belonged to them. So if you own, during times of drought, which we had, which were incredibly, incredibly um, devastating, you couldn't, um, the canal companies wanted you to purchase stock within their canal companies so then if we're delivering water, we're gonna kind of deliver water to the people that are partial owners of our canal companies. And then every, what's ever kind of left over will go over to you know, the people that are next in line. And that really wasn't fair because maybe I didn't own stock in your canal company, but I had been farming the lot, my land and my property and irrigating it and being using the property long before maybe my neighbor was. And so why is my neighbor getting water before me when I've been working the land actually longer and stuff? So that's really important that it belongs to the land, not to the individual landowner. So you mentioned the, the, the creation of the Salt River Project. Mm -hmm. And I know we needed a little help before we could get to that point, Eileen, uh, in the form of, of money. Uh, we, uh, the, like many Western states, we didn't have the funds uh, on our own to, uh, to engage in these large reclamation projects. So the Reclamation Act and the association uh, set the stage for that. Uh, would one of you like to tell us a little bit about the Reclamation Act? Well, I, I tell you what, um, Arizona could not have been happier when Theodore Roosevelt became president. Um, first of all, when we're trying to develop this water system and we understand what reclamation is, we're putting aside this national forest for this. Um, it's really, oh my goodness gracious. But when you look at when reclamation is happening in the Reclamation Act in 1902, Arizona didn't even become a state until 1912, February 14th, 1912. So we have this progressive block of people who have been planning for over 20, 30 years. How are we going to bring this water and ensure this stable supply of water? We understand what reclamation is, reclaiming arid land. How great is this that Theodore Roosevelt becomes president? Because he knows about the territory of Arizona. What a tie does he have to Arizona? His tie is his beloved Rough Riders are in Arizona, his son's in boarding school in Arizona at the Evans Boarding School, which is just right outside of Mesa. 
Theodore Roosevelt knows what Arizona is. He knows about the territory. He's been here. So when the Reclamation Act is passed, we think we're going to go, we're going to apply for funds to build this reservoir. We have the perfect area, 80 miles from Phoenix in the canyon. We are going to apply for these funds. Well, the problem is, again, Arizona is a territory. You have to know um, how are you going to pay this loan back if you get a loan from the federal government to build this water reservoir 80 miles from Phoenix? Hmm, how are you going to do that? So what happens is our farmers decide to get together that we are going to form a water users association. And the federal government said, if we give you a loan though, we don't want to deal with individual users paying back the loan at all. So that's how the Water Users Association was formed. The Salt River Valley Water Users Association was to act as the agent between the individual shareholders or the farmers and the federal government. But the most important thing about that that we have to put in perspective today is that how are you going to guarantee to pay back this loan to the federal government? Well, landowners pledge their land as collateral to pay back the debt that they were going to incur for the building of Roosevelt Dam, which is the cornerstone of our watershed here in the valley today. And it continues to be our watershed, our, you know, the cornerstone of our watershed. Doug, over to you for a minute. Okay, well, thanks so much, James. Um, I, we don't want to forget that uh, there's other people that uh, live in Arizona. We kind of been focused on the Phoenix uh, so far and Salt River Valley. And uh, off to the uh, left side of your screen there, you see a map of Arizona and it's divided up into three zones. Uh, the Colorado Plateau up towards the Flagstaff and Grand Canyon. Of course, the Grand Canyon is carved into that plateau, otherwise it's pretty flat. There's the mountainous zone. Uh, that's the watershed that Eileen talked about where SRP is getting its water uh, in the form of snow in the winter time. And then we have the basin and range part of the state uh, here, of course, uh, in the Phoenix area where I am and down through uh, Tucson. And in that area, you have a lot of uh, groundwater that's uh, percolated, uh, settled into the ground over many thousands of years, eons, and is uh, in the ground as uh, groundwater. And uh, off to the, uh, the right side, you see an old uh, prehistoric canal. It's a little hard to follow it. And uh, you see a, a little buckboard there with a couple of horses. That's in the middle of this uh, prehistoric canal. And of course, uh, prior to the Anglo settlers arriving, there were native peoples that lived in Arizona. And there's going to be another significant uh, lawsuit. Here's a, a photograph. These are some uh, water uh, rights settlements. Now, this is not a comprehensive map, but this, these are some significant water rights settlements in uh, southern Arizona and central uh, Phoenix area. Doug, when you say yeah. water uh, water rights settlements, uh, I've heard of something called the 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 Winters Doctrine. Is that what you're you're talking about here? Well, uh, right. The the Winters Doctrine comes from a uh, Supreme Court decision in 1908, and that establishes a right for Native peoples to a water. So essentially what the Supreme Court said is if you have set aside land in a form of a reservation, there is an implied right, a reserved right to as much water to fulfill the purposes of that reservation. So that's the Winters Doctrine and the Winters Decision from 1908. And for many years, uh, uh, it was of a little significance, but when you get into the uh, 1960s and uh, beyond, it becomes very important because at that time, Native people start to exert that right, uh, which was a reserved right. And essentially prior to that time, it was just a paper water right. But now, 
through their uh, greater political power and financial power, uh, Native peoples are asking for settlements and they're getting wet water. And of course, in Arizona, the Central Arizona Project provides that, the water. And these uh, settlements are to uh, settle claims of the Native peoples to uh, their reserved rights. And Doug, I, a question came into the chat box, which is, I think, squarely in, in your corner, given your background. And it makes more sense to ask it now, since we're talking about it. And that is... Uh, coming from one of our, our participants up in Idaho, who's wondering how the Winters Doctrine ended up impacting the development of the Salt River Project or other water projects in the region. Well, uh, again, it goes back to the, the first in time is first in use. And so if you think about the native peoples, they're here from time immemorial. And so if you go that back that far, they have a very strong water rights claim. And it's not really uh, quantified until you get into that uh, winter's decision of 1908. And even then, it's not really, uh, they don't put numbers on the amount of water. But if you think about it, uh, the water that's coming down, those rivers and streams could be claimed by the native peoples. And it was claimed. So they did the file suit uh, in 1970s to uh, settle those claims. And so it's been in litigation ever since, and it's still in litigation. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's really a, a, a great thing if you're a lawyer, it's the uh, Full Employment Act. And if you're <laughs> fortunate enough to be a historian that works for the lawyers, that's a great too. Uh, but uh, they're working uh, to settle these the claims to that water. And so that's why it's very important to places like the Salt River Project. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. Um, and Eileen, we're going back to you. Yeah. So talk a little bit about um, uh, what, what became possible with the funds that flowed from the federal government via the Reclamation Act. It just opened up Arizona and the Salt River Valley to amazing opportunities in many different ways. Um, construction on the dam began in 1906, uh, Theodore Roosevelt Dam, um, also known as the Tonto Dam um, to start with. And it was uh, just amazing that as the dam is being built, pictures of it even appear in Scientific American. It is such an amazing project that we're going to harness this water and we're going to bring it down to the valley. We're going to make a stable supply of water. But there were some issues with it also that they needed power up there to build the dam. So this is how forethinking and foresighted people are in the valley because now they're seeing well, we have to have power up here to be able to run our equipment. So SRP decide, or it's made that the dam is going to be a hydropower dam and it's gonna produce electricity. Originally to power everything that they needed to build the dam, but hey, we can supply limited amounts of power to some of the mining communities and we can do a couple of other things so at that time, people are truly realizing that um, with hydropower being the, com the component, the main component of the dam, besides just water storage, hey, power can pay for, for water. Isn't that neat that it can start paying for it and it can start helping to pay back the debt that we have if we can provide power to mines and down in the valley won't that be great with this hydropower? So um, it's a pretty amazing, amazing one dam is going to, to just transform all of the Salt River Valley. But not only does it transform it water-wise, but it transforms it people-wise as well, because now people are trying to want to go see this. So it's opening up like a whole tourist industry of people coming up to the dam what is this thing that's happening so far away? Isn't this neat? We want to see it. People are starting to have some leisure time, 
So now not only do we have an active construction site with this fabulous project that's happening, but now we have people coming up to see it. And um, if you look at the uh, water icon down below, you can see that once the dam was completed on March 18th, 1911, we went from zero in the slides before to 1.2 million acre feet of water stored. That's a lot of water. And how much is an acre foot of water? An uh, acre foot of water is 360,000 gallons of water, roughly enough to cover one acre of water. To put that into our perspective, an acre foot of water is a football field um, covered with water to the depth of about a foot. So that's a lot that we went from bam, as soon as the dam was, um, was completed. And the original structure was 280 feet high. Um, and it was built with uh, stones that were blasted right out of the canyon wall. So it provided job opportunities. It provided uh, leisure. It provided water for the valley. And still today, it's the keystone to our system. But we needed more than just Roosevelt Dam. Oh, yes, we did. We did. We have so much happening in this um, strange amount of time. You know, it's like, oh, my gosh, we're going to build this dam. But then uh, between 1898 and 1904, there were a series of droughts. And then all of a sudden, a flood in 1905. And the flood washed out many diversion dams along the way that's going to um, let us control water. So once again, we go to the federal government and say, well, we need a little bit more permanent dam built. So we build the Granite Reef Diversion Dam, which is at the confluence of the Salt and the Verde Rivers. And what it allows us to do is to divert water from our systems into which canals um, will be moving the water through the system at all. So again, we're building this um, and the federal government is giving us loans to do this. So when you look at the shareholders who are pledging their property as collateral to build, to pay back this loan, and we're only a territory when a lot of this is happening. And it's not until, you know, Roosevelt Dam is completed in, in 19, 1911, again, well before Arizona became a state. So there's a lot of pressure on people to have that foresight and have it down pat. How are we going to move the water through the system? We're gonna build some infrastructure. That's what we need some um, additional funds for. Granite Reef Diversion Dam, buying the canals that are in the system that had been used by private companies. We need to unify everything and get it all together so it's under one entity working for the people and our shareholders here in the valley to ensure water. Uh, Eileen, when did, when did we get power in the valley? Well, we were getting power down in the valley as early as 1909. We were providing power in the valley. And what's really interesting is if anybody is brave enough to drive the Apache Trail, which is basically from Super, uh, uh, Apache Junction up and drives the Apache Trail, you can look as you are on the trail and you will see some of the early power lines still exist, the original power lines still exist. And what they um, did was to build these power lines, which you can see in the picture there, do they look a little bit familiar to the audience that's looking at this picture? They sort of do to me, but what they are were early windmills without the blades put on them because you could buy them and construct them. So a lot of the early power lines were portions of windmills that were strung down. And some of those original structures are still standing today. So, and then we have pump houses um, that are here that um, we still relied on um, uh, well pumps and everything. So that's what the water, that's what um, it was, uh, the power was powering mostly these well pumps for um, our agricultural community. And um, 
Doug, there's something else that happened around this same time, as I recall. And uh, actually, maybe both of you would like to talk a little bit about this. It was, it was called the Kent Decree. Remind me what that was about. Well, I'll, ju I'll jump in here, and I, Alina will give you a little break uh, for a little while, but you can certainly uh, uh, pick up anytime you want. Uh, to the uh, left there, you see a map of the uh, what they call the Kent Decree lands, and that was uh, in 1910 after Judge Edward Kent. And uh, essentially what uh, Judge Kent did was to look at all the a prior appropriation dates in the valley and assign land to a certain classes. So you see uh, the blue, that's the class A, uh, that's the uh, best land, that's been uh, irrigated the longest. Uh, the class B is in red, uh, that's been irrigated uh, for a less amount of time. And then the class C in the white areas uh, uh, some of that was only irrigated maybe once or twice or not at all. So essentially, uh, in order to uh, settle some of these water rights issues, they had to have a list of uh, what land had a water right. And so uh, <laughs> Judge Ganta did this and really that uh, settled it and allowed the uh, Salt River Project to, to develop. So I think that's the kind of a, what we need to know about the Kent Decree. If you want to throw something else on that I may have missed, Eileen. Yeah. Um, well, and actually what was so interesting about the Kent Decree was that it was um, the uh, Salt River Valley Water Users Association needed to work. We had 4,500 members at that time. And we had to work out an agreement with our shareholders that clarified their rights to, to the water. So supposedly it was somewhat of a friendly lawsuit, but um, the Kent Decree still governs water management in Arizona today. And that's what's really important is something that was decreed in 1910. I mean, when you look at all of these plots of land and everything, wow, he's looking at it going, who's been using the land the longest continuously, who's sort of been using it, then who hasn't been using it. And that's how we're gonna appropriate the water. And we still use that as our basis today in the Salt River Valley. Eileen and Doug, um, I, the map is fascinating. I found my, my house, my neighborhood, and it's on a Kent class A land. What does that mean? Well, oh, go ahead, Doug. You look like you were going to answer. <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> well, no, I was just going to say that's the best water right is the, the Class A lands. Those are the oldest of lands. And so uh, those are the ones that were irrigated the longest. Now, realize it covers a large amount of time. So, uh, you know, the first land was settled in 18... 69 and so uh, those are the earliest ones so there's a wide range of actual dates but what it means is that even in a drought those class a lands are going to be getting water they have the best water rights and as you go on if there is a drought uh, some of those class of bees uh, lands that could be cut off if there's not enough water to go around and then uh, if you're in class c you're probability of being cut off in a serious drought could be higher. So uh, that's really uh, the range of those uh, classes. Mm -hmm. uh, but of course, uh, fortunately, we've done pretty well and had uh, very few droughts. There's been a, a couple, but uh, uh, they've managed to, uh, as SRP has, to deliver water in the drought and non-drought periods. Mm -hmm. um, well, moving along in SRP's history, Eileen, uh, what <laughs> happened in, in 1917? Well, in 1917, what we had to do was we were looking, it's called the 1917, we call it the 1917 contract. Um, it's between the United States government and the Salt River Valley Water Users Association. And what happened in the 1917 contract was just one more thing to solidify the operation of the water system for the Salt River Valley. Um, 
the association, Water Users Association, um, received the operational control of the project, which was the dams. Um, we, uh, but they still retain title to it. We were just going to operate the dam. Uh, we were gonna collect payments from the federal government then, or collect payments from our shareholders to pay the federal government back. And what it also allowed us to do was keep um, power revenues and be able to reinvest them into the future of SRP and reinvest it into um, water development and infrastructure for us. And then I just always like to point out this early um, building, we used to call it the Water Temple. And that was the early headquarters of the Salt River Valley Water Users Association. But if you look really close at the, in the forefront of the picture, you can see a lateral running right in front of our building. So it's kind of neat that it's, we called it the Water Temple and there it is <laughs> with water running in it. Well, we're having so much fun um, that we're, ch we're a little chattier than I had anticipated. So uh, we're almost at seven o'clock. So we're gonna speed up the rest of the presentation so that we have time to take questions. Doug, my, my next question is, how the heck did the water get from the canals into people's homes? <laughs> did we lose Doug? No, he's just on mute. Oh. <laughs> Uh, hi, James. Yeah, I have a little trouble with the muting there. Uh, so uh, the way it works is that uh, SRP, through the uh, Reclamation Bureau, Bureau of Reclamation, is only required to deliver the water to the highest point in each a quarter section. And from that point, in the old days, it was the farmer's uh, responsibility to uh, move it uh, through these small laterals to the farm. Well, that's all well and good, but uh, when you start to get the cities in here, then uh, slowly the cities took over the responsibility to deliver that water uh, through a municipal water plant and into people's homes. And the big uh, breakthrough for the city of Phoenix came in uh, 1922 when it completed a redwood pipeline from the Verde River to the city of Phoenix. And you see that Redwood pipeline there to the left. And on the right, you see the Verde River and they had a, what's called an infiltration gallery to collect the water. So it uh, collected through small gaps in the pipe, went into the Redwood pipeline and then was delivered to uh, the city of Phoenix where it could be delivered into people's houses. So. Uh, at this point, you really start to get a difference between a municipal and agricultural use. And of course, uh, you still had a lot of uh, groundwater wells uh, that were used for uh, domestic use. So that's kind of when it begins. For those uh, um, who, who might not have visited the Heritage Center in Tempe, we actually have a section of that Redwood uh, pipeline on, on exhibit. Um, but you know we've been talking a lot about uh, Salt River Project and and surface water and groundwater. But another major source of water that we have in Arizona is water from the Colorado River. And we're coming up on the hundredth anniversary of what is known as the Colorado River Compact. And the Arizona Historical Society will definitely be doing some programming and other events to commemorate that anniversary. Could you tell us a little bit about that, Doug? Yeah, I'd be happy to, James. Uh, that's a, a very important uh, compact that uh, really is going to lead to the Central Arizona Project, uh, CAP. So we've talked about SRP, that's Salt River Water. The CAP is Colorado River Water. And uh, this has to do with flooding on the Colorado River. They wanted to control that. Uh, the federal government did. And they also wanted to uh, use that water for irrigation. So they had the idea to build a large dam on the Colorado River. Eventually, it was called a Boulder Dam, a Hoover Dam, we call it today. But before they got there, they had to reach an agreement uh, very similar to that Kent Decree to decide, well, what states were going to get what water. 
and they uh, did that in 1922. So they had representatives uh, from the seven states uh, that had uh, Colorado River going through them. And you see them there in the picture on the left, the one of the second uh, from the uh, left there in the light colored suit, that's a uh, W.S. Norvell, that's Arizona's uh, delegate. And so what they decided to do was to split the Colorado River at Lee's Ferry and the upper basin states got half of the water, the lower basin states got the other half. And they figured at the time was about 15 million acre feet. And of course, someone did ask a question in the chat, uh, was that uh, a normal year? Well, it turned out to be that those are kind of wet years that they based it on. And so uh, in more recent years, they haven't been getting quite as much water. So they split it uh, 7.5 million acre feet to the upper basin, 7.5 million acre feet to the lower basin. Well, Arizona thought uh, it ought to get more, and so it never did ratify the compact. Uh, actually, they did, but it was in 1944. So Arizona was the odd person out, and it's because of that guy on the, on the right there, uh, Governor Hunt, George W.P. Hunt. He thought Arizona got a raw deal uh, uh, from the Colorado River Compact. Arizona didn't ratify it till 1944. Uh, and there's another story about uh, how they divvied up the uh, 7.5 million acre feet, but I'm going to hold that for a little bit later. All right, Eileen, we're back to you for uh, a little bit now. I will, uh, I will make this quick. <laughs> um, with SRP realizing that they could provide um, electricity or you know water and boy, you have this power. So we decided there was a gentleman in charge of SRP at the time, C.C. Cragen, who was an absolute visionary in 1922. Um, we're in the midst of um, a, a, we're war years, um, cotton prices fell dramatically. There, you know, we're having trouble paying back some of our loans uh, to the federal government. So he comes up with an idea hey, in order to, with this economic slowdown, let's build a couple of more dams. Let's incur more debt, but we're gonna, be, we're gonna make those hydroelectric dams so we can produce electricity and we can sell that electricity because electricity is the paying partner of water. So he's a visionary. He's gonna say, okay, let's get these dams going. So we have Horse Mesa Dam, Mormon Flat Dam, and Stewart Mountain Dam that you can see. And now um, we're not, we're able to generate uh, electricity at a reasonable rate, hydroelectricity at reasonable times when our customers are needing electricity. Um, it increased our ability to manage water, these additional dams. And um, we finally now have a unified uh, project with uh, dams on the, the Verde, which are water reservoir dams. We have dams on the, on the Salt, which are um, hydroelectric dams. We have a unified water system. We are set now for electricity and water management. Does that take us through these slides, Eileen? Do you wanna, I wanna yes. talk a little bit then about growth in the 1950s? Well, it was just that you can see one of these that I just, um, one of the slides that I wanted to show you is of course, this is our iconic Camelback Mountain that you can see. So you're looking at it in 1947. Then you can see the development after World War II when we have a lot of um, servicemen coming back to the valley um, to where when you purchased a home, uh, right in your mortgage came um, air conditioning. So we have air conditioning now coming. You have John F. Long developing. So the valley is really, really growing. And then you look at Camelback Mountain and you know, like 1996, that area, you can see how we've gone from agricultural to an urban setting. And that's what people are, are asking about is um, how do we manage the water and how do we have enough water? 
Well, we do because we are slowly going from an agricultural setting to an urban setting. And right now the water management is very good for that changeover because uh, urban uses a less, little bit less water than agriculture does. And Salt River Project, just so that everybody knows, we supply the raw water to the cities. The cities are the one that treat the water and put it into your house. We do supply the raw irrigation water to our agricultural communities and to communities um, within the valley that still get um, urban irrigation. Eileen, you teed up Doug perfectly for uh, the next part of the presentation, which relates to a fourth source of water in Arizona, and that is uh, reclaimed water. Doug? Yeah, thanks very much, uh, James. Uh, this is uh, effluent, mm -hmm. and uh, the, these two slides are about the uh, Central Arizona project still. That's uh, the interconnection between uh, the Salt River project and the Central Arizona project on the left. That's the interconnection facility. Mm -hmm. And on your right is the uh, Deer Valley Water Treatment Plant, which uh, uses Central Arizona project water. So, but to get to your point about uh, the uh, Pal Verde nuclear generating station and how it uses effluent, if we kind of keep going, there you go, to your right there is Palo Verde. And uh, we talk about the classes of water, surface water, uh, ground water, and now we have effluent, which is treated wastewater. And uh, they had an agreement, uh, the cities did, with the uh, Arizona Public Service to use a wastewater, treated wastewater, to cool the reactors at Palo Verde. Well, uh, John F. Long, a, a big developer in the valley, sued. And he says, look, uh, you can't take that water because it has its origins with the Salt River Project and take it all the way to Palo Verde, which is out by Tonopah. So uh, they sued, and eventually the Arizona Supreme Court uh, made a decision that said, well, effluent is a different class of water, and it belongs to the municipalities. This decision was in 1989, and they have the right to treat it and do with it as they see fit. So if they decide to sell it to Palo Verde, that's okay, that's legal. So uh, from now on out after that decision, effluent, treated effluent has become a huge water source in Arizona. Recycled water, we call it today, it's uh, put back in the ground uh, for indirect potable uh, use. And in some places in the world, it's uh, reused directly through high forms of treatment. So a very important source of water today. And we, uh, we skipped a couple slides here, Eileen. Did you wanna? No, we can go, cause we can go to, I know we're running short on time and okay. we had a question from Brenda that I just really wanted to. Yeah, please do. We can go to the end if you want. All right, we'll, we'll do that at the end cause we're, we're almost done here. So Doug, you had a few more photographs of, of some of the, the other infrastructure here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, this has to do with that movement uh, from agriculture to urban use. Uh, to the left is the uh, City of Phoenix Verde water treatment plant that was constructed in 1947, actually on the Salt River of Pima Maricopa Indian community lands near Fort McDowell. And it's uh, taking water from the Verde River and putting it into that pipeline we saw earlier to Phoenix. Well, uh, that turned out to be an issue also because, of course, uh, some other folks said, well, that water belongs to us, the agricultural folks. So uh, the city of Phoenix reached an agreement in 1952 uh, and constructed these gates on Horseshoe Dam, if you see those uh, to the right there. And uh, since the city paid for those that developed water, uh, behind there belongs to the city of Phoenix. So uh, these two agreements have uh, paved the way for a uh, orderly transition from agricultural use uh, to urban use. So when Eileen was talking earlier about uh, SRP delivering waters to the cities, these contracts, and every city has one now, allow for that uh, delivery and use. Mm -hmm.
just a couple more. It shows those uh, horseshoe dams uh, spilling there. And of course, uh, the gates were designed to save that water. And uh, to your right there is the 24th Street water treatment plant for Phoenix. Again, it's taking water from the SRP canal. It's treated and it's delivered to homes uh, constructed in Phoenix on SRP lands. Mm -hmm. And Eileen, I know you're, you're gonna wrap up here before we take questions to talk a little bit about uh, water resiliency and stewardship, which is so important. It is so important to us, the water resiliency. And, you know, we're constantly looking at what we have in our, our portfolio. We're, we just don't sit still. And um, we, you know, we've made significant modifications to Roosevelt Dam as part of Plan 6. We modified um, a lot of all of our dams with Plan 6. Um, it was when the federal government did an inventory of dams. But Roosevelt Dam was originally, this is how we're building on water resiliency. Roosevelt Dam was originally uh, meant to be a water storage dam. So hence you had to wait for it to fill up before you could release water because the spillways were designed at the very top of the dam. Well, with plan six and the modification to the dam, we realized that, okay, the spillways were brought down so we can release water as needed it doesn't have to be released when it gets all the way full. So here we are still providing water to the valley, still looking at that. Um, this is the um, SRP CAP interconnect, another image of it that uh, Doug was talking about. And, and just, just real quick for clarification, because I know folks who have lived here a long time are going to want to know the image that we're looking at here of Roosevelt Dam. Is that after the height was increased or is this before? It was heightened 77 feet. And a lot of people, um, we do a little bit, I'll get phone calls often that will say, um, first it was Boulder Dam, then it was Hoover Dam. When did you rename it Roosevelt Dam? Well, okay. because it has the cement face on it now, you don't see the original stonework from the dam. You can see a little bit of it from the backside. Um, it is a very industrial looking dam. It still is a beautiful dam. And, um, but it, it's heightened 77 feet. So it allows us to store more water in it for use as we move downstream. So we've, we've made it both water, um, both water storage and flood control. Uh, so, so this is showing the dam at its current height? Yes, at its current height, yes. Okay, and just to make a, a important historical point for those of you who love objects, uh, the Salt River Project uh, graciously donated to the Arizona His Heritage Center in Tempe, the original capstones uh, from from the 1911 dam when the dam was raised and not a lot of people know that uh, the fountain in the courtyard at the Arizona Heritage Center is actually built from those capstones. Yes, so it's fabulous. <laughs> so we continue our stewardship. We're continuously um, trying to, we do water banking now with GRUS, which is the underground water reef Granite Reef Underground Storage Project. We have the Agua Fria. So we're doing water banking. Um, we've purchased, we have CC Cragen Dam, um, which is used to be the Blue Ridge Dam. And that is so that we can meet domestic use for water requests, uh, municipal water needs in Gila County. Um, we're into, the, like I said, the ground recharge with Rust Agua Fria all of that. So we are continually trying to um, make sure that we have our water supplies done. I just wanted to show real quick about canal multiple use. You saw on one of some of the earlier slides how the canals crisscrossed around the valley. Those were gathering points for people early in Phoenix. You pit in it, you, you had your dances, you had all sorts of important occasions. And then as roads became more readily usable, people um, um, lost sight of the canals. Well, here's a project, we're doing some canal multiple use projects. We work with the different cities to make the um, canals 
and the canal banks back into um, uh, community gathering points again. So here's Arizona Falls, which was an actual fall on the um, Arizona Canal. And here we've worked with the city of Phoenix and it's made it into a gathering point once again for people. And it does produce hydroelectricity. Um, we have canal trails and maps up in the upper corner. So if you are a jogger, a runner, you can go along our canal banks and, it's, and it helps you track how far you've gone, uh, interesting points along the way and stuff. Um, and Eileen, can you tell us a little bit about where we could learn more about Salt River Projects Heritage? Well, we have, um, you can go to srpnet.com backslash history. We have a, a several um, books online that tell about SRP that you can learn all about. It has photographs and maps and just you know, amazing information um, on that. I also wanted to let everybody know that we also have a heritage map. Um, that you can go on to. It's also a mobile app and you can go on to that. So as you are jogging or going along any of our canals, you can, um, it has points of interest that you can see like a before and an after all along different ways if you're recreating on our canal banks and stuff. And it's all at srpnet.com backslash history. You'll be able to find all that information. So take the time to download some of our eBooks and our information. I'll put that in the chat, Eileen. Thank you very much. I appreciate uh, all that uh, both of you have shared with us this, this evening. The chat box has been um, pretty, pretty active. So I'm gonna see if there we go. All right, uh, now everybody should be able to see us a little bit better. And uh, one of the first questions that I, I wanna cover is uh, one that came in, Eileen, that you noted in particular, if, if folks are interested in water resources and infrastructure in, in Arizona or anything else that we've learned about tonight, um, what are some of your favorite sources for information? Um, oh, well, let's see. Favorite sources, of inf I have so many of them. I actually rely, believe it or not, on our SRP books. Um, there's, um, and then if you're just interested in reading about early water in Arizona, it's a delightful read. Um, it's called Water by the Inch by Herbert Young. I do admit it is one of my favorite ones. It's about water along the uh, Gila River at the turn of the century, and it is wonderful. So there are many, many sources out there. Um, the Bureau of Reclamation is fabulous with their information about water in the valley. Doug, how about you? Well, thanks, James, to get the opportunity to plug my book. Yep. So, <laughs> uh, just Google my name, A Fuel for Growth, The Water in Arizona's Urban Environment. That's a story of a Phoenix a Flagstaff in Tucson and the water history of those uh, three communities. Uh, but beyond that, uh, certainly the Department of uh, Water Resources, ADWR, has a lot of information on its uh, website. Uh, so uh, that's a great one. Uh, the classic water book, uh, of course, is The Cadillac Desert uh, oh. by Mark Reisner. Yep, yep, mm -hmm. absolutely. Another one of, uh, that, that I particularly love that's a little bit broader uh, than, than just Arizona, it covers the Southwest in general, but I think it is one of the most comprehensive books on this subject I've ever seen. And that is William Dubuise's book, A Great Aridness. Mm -hmm. um, that is a fantastic read for those of you who uh, you know, want to learn more about um, what we are potentially looking at as the climate here becomes warmer and drier. Another question that came in might be for you, Doug, from Christopher, and that is that California has had low flow water fixtures since the 1980s, though it does have a larger population than Arizona, and, and it shares Colorado River water with Arizona. Uh, the question is, should Arizona not push for similar laws uh, since its population is rapidly growing as well? 
that's a great question, uh, Christopher. Uh, the way it works is uh, those uh, laws are really passed at the federal level for the most part. And uh, by EPA, they have a program for water sense. And uh, I don't want to get into recent politics, but there's been some pushback against the water conserving fixtures uh, lately. Uh, but those are uh, great things and they've worked tremendously and our actual per capita consumption of water has gone down. Uh, really why the population has increased it quite a bit. Now, water saving fixtures aren't the only reason, but a lot of things, dishwashers, washing machines, uh, smaller lot sizes, uh, conservation messaging, all of that has uh, reduced the per capita water use. So uh, all those are, are great things, in my opinion, to uh, help conserve water. Mm -hmm. Anything to add to that, Eileen? Well, um, you know, and, and that, that, that is part of it is that uh, Salt River Project, we manage, we manage our water so well, but that doesn't mean we don't encourage water um, conservation. It, on our website, just srpnet.com, we offer all sorts of programs on um, both, both water conservation and energy conservation um, in your homes. Um, zero scaping landscape. So we are constantly encouraging it um, because we are good um, community citizens, you know, along with everybody else. We want to encourage the, the, um, the conservation of water and power and using it wisely. That's what it is, is using your resources wisely. And on our website, we have multiple different programs from rebate programs to how to's to online um, now virtual programming. So you can learn some of this stuff. Uh, Eileen, the next one might be for you. This comes in from one of our viewers in Idaho. And she's interested in knowing if the Salt River Project system uh, it also incorporates drains in addition to the canals and laterals. Drains. I don't, I'm not sure what she means by drains okay. because we don't drain water anywhere. It is running all through our system and all of our water is used. Cities put in orders for waters, we deliver it to what you know, we deliver it to the municipalities. So it's all done by water orders. And um, we maintain the big system. Now, if you get irrigation, you personally are in charge of maintaining your irrigation system for your home if you're getting irrigation to do flood irrigation to water your property. But I, everything is well maintained. I think the question may tie to the to the part two, which is whether the 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 irrigation um, that is made possible through the Salt River Project, uh, what that has done to the salinity of the lands that are under cultivation, and part two is did it raise the water table? And I recognize that 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 may be in in Doug's court, but mm -hmm. either one of you, go ahead. Go ahead, Doug. Yeah, if I can jump in on that, James, the, the short answer to the question is uh, not anymore. Mm -hmm. But in the olden days, uh, drainage was a, a big concern. Oh. And after the uh, Roosevelt Dam was uh, completed and they started putting a lot of water on the land, they actually had a water logging problem here in the valley. It's hard to believe, but uh, basements of buildings in downtown Phoenix, the water table was so high that uh, water was seeping into the basements. Mm -hmm. So uh, what the, the water users did is they uh, erected a number of wells or drilled a number of wells to drain that water. And so under long-term contracts, that water was pumped uh, from the aquifer and sent over to other areas. For example, the Roosevelt Irrigation District, the Buckeye Irrigation District, so it was really was a wastewater at the time. Now, of course, the water table has uh, dropped. And so uh, there is no uh, groundwater close to the surface. And those wells are really pumping a very valuable water under those long-term contracts. So uh, we don't have drains like you might think in an agricultural area, 
like you might have in the Imperial Irrigation District uh, and not anymore in the Salt River Project, but they do have a continued uh, well pumping program. Yeah. All right. Um, our next question was about, <laughs> we're going to have to do a little research on this. You know what? Uh, it, the, we hadn't anticipated the question about just how much effluent uh, Palo Verde uses. Um, I'll see if I can get uh, the answer on that in the background here. Um, but uh, next up, we have a, let's see, oh, stories about people water skiing and being towed by pickups along the canals. Anybody want to comment on that? Uh, well, yes, they did. Our canals at one time were a tremendous source of recreation. Yes, where people would get um, water skis and have the truck drive along, along the water bed or along the, the um, bank and water ski to swimming to, and that's when um, community, you know, communities recreated and picnicked on the canals. Now we don't um, encourage swimming in the canals or water skiing in the canals now. Um, and the reason that we don't is we have, um, what people don't understand is while the water may look, look um, crystal smooth on the top, when you get down to the undercurrent, it is ripping through those canals. It's not as smooth as glass as it appears on the top. So they are very, very dangerous. Most people would swim in the smaller laterals as opposed to the big major canals. And we just don't encourage that because of the safety. But we are encouraging people to um, once again, come back to the canals to do the jogging, not necessarily be in the water itself, but to do the joggings, appreciate the historic sites and that type of thing. So it is very dangerous, but that is how I learned how some people learned how to swim was in the canals, but not today. <laughs> SRP provides swimming lessons <laughs> and, and <laughs> as part Jack, of our, our safety connection. So we and, provide swimming lessons, yes. <laughs> Jack, Join Jack from, from right upstairs in my house, I got an answer to your question about just how much uh, effluent uh, Palo Verde uses. And it's, uh, it's quite a, a big number, actually. I haven't multiplied it out, but I'll, I'll leave that to you and put it in the chat. So uh, the answer is, it depends on the season. In the winter, <laughs> Palo Verde uses approximately 40,000 gallons of effluent every minute. And in the summertime, it uses approximately 60,000 gallons every minute. Mm -hmm. Um, let's see well, what we have. The other Go thing ahead. people that I think is, is really amazing is that um, water is a very complicated issue. I would say everywhere in the world, it's a complicated issue. Um, I, you know, always, you know, you turn on the faucet and you get your water and you really kind of don't think a lot about everything that went into making sure you had a water supply how that water supply is managed so that when you turn on your faucet or you, um, you know, drink that glass of iced tea or whatever, somewhere, somehow, there's a lot of thought that went to putting in and making that a stable supply for you. So it is a very complicated issue on multiple, multiple, you know, personal levels, municipality levels, state level, federal level, across the whole United States, there's a lot that goes into making sure every drop is accounted for. Hey, uh, James, uh, I'm going to jump in here. I have to uh, send my apologies. I have to get off the call. Uh, so I'm thankful for everyone who uh, joined us tonight and grateful for your interest and participation and if you do have a questions, uh, go ahead and post those. That uh, James will get those to me. And uh, it's been wonderful spending some time with you guys. Thank you, Doug. Eileen and I will stay with you all for the the last ten minutes or so and answer as many of the questions in the chat as we can in that time. Uh, Eileen, uh, one came in from Nate, who's wondering about 
um, the 1913 congressional investigation that uh, looked into the location of Roosevelt Dam, the Salt versus the Gila location in which Dwight Hurd and Asa Chandler testified. That's not something I know a whole lot about. Is that one that you are comfortable fielding or should we get that answer from Doug? I think we'll need to get that answer from Doug on that okay. one, I'm sorry, yes. Uh, under, understandable. Um, okay, and uh, then I see the chat has been very active. Um, how much should we worry about the, um, I'm not sure that Eileen or I know very much about this one, unfortunately. Um, how much should we be worried about a company that is fighting to frack near a groundwater site in the Flagstaff area? That would fall outside of your watershed. Uh, so you're probably not yeah. aware of that, Eileen. Yeah, no, uh -uh. That's, uh, that's outside of our territory. Yeah, nor am I um, familiar with that, but we'll see if we uh, can get an answer from Doug and follow up on that one. Yeah. Um, uh, and there are some more uh, great suggestions for resources in the um, uh, in the chat box. <laughs> Susie uh, uh, opines, maybe if people in the valley had to haul their water, every drop would be pr uh, precious. Yes, um, uh, yes perhaps it, it, it would be. Um, although Eileen, could you say a little bit about the, the absolutely uh, remarkable job that we have done in terms of conservation uh, without any actual laws mandating it? Well, you know, and, and that's the thing is that at least within our watershed that or within our water service territory that SRP manages, we work very closely with all of our different communities to be able to get the word out how precious water is like that liquid gold that um, it we we people had such vision in the past that SRP has the vision now. And that's why we're working with different communities on all different types of programming so that we are constantly have the word out there that we're, we're, we're working with our communities, we're working with you. What, what kind of resources do you need? And that's why we offer all of that stuff um, online, we offer seminars, workshops, and rebates and stuff. It is so important to us to be able to conserve water and to manage water. We have people coming from all over the world, actually, that looks at Salt River Project system and how do we manage the water system for the Salt River Valley so that there's a constant supply of water. Um, I see a question that has come in from from Z and it's a it's a sensitive question but I I don't want to uh, overlook it because mm -hmm. it's a very important one and mm -hmm. and quite frankly it's one that um, that I'm very open in talking about with my own students at the university and I don't see why we shouldn't address it here mm -hmm. which is um, you know what about the Colorado River water? Uh, that is due to uh, Mexico. The Colorado River, at least once upon a time, and uh, still in very rare years, does make it, um, uh, make it all the way to the Sea of Cortez. And mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately, um, uh, the allocation that is supposed to go to um, Mexico, just as um, uh, that is still being adjudicated for the sovereign nations of Arizona is uh, that commitment is not always fulfilled. And I want to go back to a question that Nate asked earlier, which is very, very important. And that is about the, the time frame when so many of these um, decisions were made in the first couple of decades of the uh, uh, 20th century which was at a time that 
no one had any way of knowing at that time that they were basing these decisions on a flow of water that was being measured in, in incredibly wet years, a very wet period, the wettest in 500 years. Mm -hmm. And so uh, the, the bottom line is, I mean, this is, this is just the basic historical fact that everybody should be starting from. Mm -hmm. The Colorado River water was grossly over allocated from the beginning. Mm -hmm. that, that is what it is. And, and so that has had um, ripple effects over time uh, mm -hmm. for the allocation uh, that everyone got. Um, but the, the fact of the matter is that most of the water uh, that does flow to uh, Mexico for its part of the allocation has been um, used and returned to the river and used and returned to the river many times. And so um, it is accurate to say that the water that does reach uh, Mexico has a real issue with salinity. So thank you for bringing that up, Z. It, it's, a, it's a great question. Um, well, it's funny, just like a little historical tidbit. Sorry about that, James. Just um, because it's the Salt River, there's always people that are asking, um, we get the question off, is the Salt River really salty? Um, because of its name, the Salt River. And yes, it is at its point of origin. And it's a great, great story that um, early uh, person in Arizona history, King Woolsey, actually there's salt flats up at a work at the start of the, the salt. And he actually tried to mine the salt up there to, to um, make table salt. And he was gonna corner the salt market. And then part of it was as well, it's not really the high grade of table salt that you would use, but yes, the salt river really is salty. And through the natural filtration system, a lot of it um, filters out of, out of the system by the time it gets to water treatment and stuff. And I'm gonna take one last question that came into the chat. That'll be the last one. And that is uh, questions about um, limiting growth. And, um, you know, there there is no easy answer to that. Uh, I, I, I'll say a little bit and then Eileen, maybe you can um, give us a little, a little bit of a glimpse into um, the future, because how water is being used in the future will, it, it inevitably will change. And, and that is part of the key to growth. And so uh, I will just say that, um, you know, that is, that is always the uh, first question that is, is asked typically in conversations about um, uh, water in the desert and whether or not our way of life is sustainable. And the, the answer as is often true, um, the, 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 the answer, the truth there is somewhere in the middle. Um, and the bottom line is that um, the economy in Arizona is so heavily weighted towards growth and always has been that um, any solution that comes to the challenges that come with growth is, is going to have to be gradual uh, ra rather than a jump off a cliff, which would be catastrophic. But Eileen, what do you see when you look into the future in terms of growth? You know, I, I look at um, the way the future's happening, the way Arizona is growing so quickly. And I look at, the solutions that SRP is working on, you know, we are doing water banking. So we're putting water back in the, the aquifers. We're managing the, the wells. We're, um, our service territories gradually changing from agriculture to urban. And so I think as I, the future that I see is that SRP is gonna be around for another hundred years. We've been around for over a hundred years now managing the water and have done a very good job for the people that live within our service territory. But not only do we look out for the folks within our that live within our service territory, but we look out through all of Arizona 
and we're constantly working with um, other organizations within Arizona and outside of Arizona to manage the water, to make sure that we are doing it correctly and that the people of Arizona will continue to have their supply of water. Thank you so much for your time tonight, Eileen. And uh, in closing, I want to end on time and just say that at the beginning, I should have drawn a little uh, better connection for all of you between the Arizona Historical Society and this history of water in Arizona and the Phoenix Mural Festival. Um, and that connection is that the 2021 theme for the Phoenix Mural Festival is water. And uh, you can find out more about that and this year's concentrated mural project, which is along one of the Salt River Project canals located between 7th Street and 15th Avenue. So for more about that, you can uh, just Google Phoenix Mural Festival. And uh, with that, I thank all of you for joining us tonight and wish you a wonderful evening. Bye-bye now. <laughs>